Shabbat Shalom uh, to everyone who's joined us today for the live gathering and for those of you that are joining us uh, via video. Um, we welcome you and I'm glad you can be a part of, uh, of what His Spirit is doing with us at this in these incredible times together as a community, communities and family and uh, all that is happening in His house. Um, if you want to know more um, and you're seeing this for the first time or haven't connected in with the community, just go to rivershabbat.com and um, go in there and type that in. You'll see the website will come up and uh, just go down, hit subscribe for newsletter, and then just put in your email, first and last name, and that'll put you on the community list. And uh, every week we send out a newsletter, and in that newsletter is the uh, link, the Zoom link for our live gathering, should you wish to join us and, uh, and various other things that we put in the newsletter from time to time. So you're very welcome and uh, we hope you can come and be with us in the community. Okay, the holiday season, the fruit of traditions. Every year, um, Every year I do this, um, not because our traditions are appointed times. <laughs> we'll talk about a bit about this because every year we do uh, teachings around his biblical calendar appointed times. This is the one that I do every year because man in its traditions has made this an appointed time of the year. And so uh, I address it from the perspective of um, trying to serve honorably and humbly into the body to take stock and just look at what these uh what this holiday season is and how it plays out with us in our journeys and our friends our family both believing and unbelieving around us and i think it's important that we uh, are not um, shy that we don't shy away from uh, understanding some of the things from a healthy and balanced perspective regarding this thing we call the holiday season. So everybody here is experiencing that right now. Some of you may have even been celebrating uh, uh, the tradition of Hanukkah. Um, I, I know so many of my Jewish friends are and things like that um, as well. And um, there are probably not a lot in this community, but they, you'll certainly have friends and family that will be celebrating Christmas uh, coming up. And so uh, there's all sorts of things that come around this time of the year. And I find that this is the type of, this is the time of the year for us to look really good. I think in the father's eyes as a witness or perhaps to look really bad. And in fact, probably this is the time of the year where sometimes we look the very best or the worst that one can look at, um, in the father's eyes anyway. Um, and the opportunity to be pleasing in his sight or not to be interesting enough because we can sometimes hide in our biblical appointed times can't we we can hide in that and do our thing and whatnot but now we get challenged with things that um are happening in these traditions uh in in the world around us and they're not biblical and then how are we going to respond to these things do we participate in ourselves do we attack others do we bring a self-righteous position into all of this and so it's important that we uh as as a people of faith and as his house that we are his ambassadorship this is a part of the covenant to not take his name in vain so can we do that in either direction where we're trying not to take his name in vain so we've become the self-righteous judges of all that is evil in this world um and uh and we have to defend uh god um or we become the ultimate compromisers and justifiers and we become something that is worthy of being spat out of his mouth now i do say this it's a bit of a a caveat uh, at uh, at this time of the year. Um, the disclaimer is, we're, of course, we're shooting golden calves. And so the whole thing is, and I say particularly around this type of teaching each year, is that if, um, if you haven't been offended yet during the teaching, just wait a little bit longer, likely as you will be. There's generally something in these teachings for everyone. 
So don't, if you're feeling left out and you're not having an emotional hissy fit, just keep watching. All right. And then you'll be able to join everyone else. Um, I know for me, for many, many years, dealing with this in myself and on both sides has seen such emotion. Has anybody seen emotions come up around this time of the year? Yeah, it's an incredibly uh, emotional thing. And so this gives us, again, the opportunity to um, behave badly um, or to be a, a good witness. And so the encouragement here of the River Shabbat community and family, the reasons for this teaching is actually not to offend anyone. Um, at all. It's never actually the intent. The, the intent is that we may actually grow, deal with these things so that we can have a healthy, mature, balanced perspective that hopefully becomes a light concerning our faith in our creator's eyes. You know, and who here would like to be a good witness according to the creator, not according to our traditions and denominations and religious badges? Exactly. So that's the actual goal here. So if somebody is offended and whatnot, please accept our apologies up front. I always ask up front. Um, forgive me, because that is not actually uh, the idea here, or anybody in the community. But we must be able and willing to discuss things that sometimes we want to hide around, or we want to whitewash tomb, or sweep under a mat, or defend and justify, uh, according to our emotional positions. But we're not here to live an emotional faith. We're actually here to be a representation of a biblical faith. So we must move into that space. Okay. Second Timothy four three four. Uh, for the time, for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned toward fables. This particular scripture, um, I don't know what better actually describes the reality of dealing with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and for it to be all around the appointed times, traditions, things like that. We, we need to take seriously what this is, because this is a future perspective of how bad the house of Israel or the faith, people of faith of a biblical faith are going to get. This is to the believer, okay? It's not to the unbeliever. This is us. The time's going to come when we won't tolerate it. Woe. Woe is me. And there was a time in my life when I had to face this for what it was, when I started to realize some of the ancient traditions and practices and things I was a part of as a person who would claim a biblical faith. Woe is me. So, was the Father trying to offend me with these words recorded in the New Testament 2,000 years ago from those who walked before us, who lived the faith at levels and to degrees that none of us would even be able to touch in any way, shape, or measure to the degree that they were living this and why they became the witness or the testimony of the fulfillment of the whole, what we would call, the Old Testament. This was a testimony that the great prophecies, the faith was being fulfilled in the coming of our Messiah and the establishment of both spirit and truth now and what would play out in the last days or in the last 2000 years before we go into the very last day of plan of redemption, which is uh, the last thousand years of his reign. And so we're in an exceptionally exciting time, but we're in an exceptionally deceptive time too. So for the sake of our traditions, <laughs> Matthew 15, 3 here, Yeshua is dealing with the Pharisees and he's gone. He's, he's essentially again dealing with the religious people. And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress? You yourselves transgress the commandment of Yah for the sake of your tradition. So there's nothing new under the sun. And I find myself every year saying this to believers. Why do you do it? I know your excuses, your justifications, your fake news, or your misrepresentation. I get it. I hear all of this. I see all of it. I even understand why you would do it. I've been there. You know? In fact, Christmas is some of my most fondest memories as a child growing up. 
are they suddenly not my fondest memories because I've understood that maybe that tradition wasn't biblical? No, of course, there's still some of my fondest memories. I'm not going to blame my, my family, my friends, my journey, the thing that the father allowed me to experience and go, oh, suddenly it was all evil and it was horrible. And I was a Satan worshiping kid at the altars of paganism and all that. No, I wasn't. I was just a kid enjoying his childhood <laughs> at Christmas. That's what I was. However, I grew up. And I started to understand that this thing that I'd called Christmas and that those around me had called Christmas and what I'd learned as Christmas wasn't actually biblical. This was a tradition that had come through. And when I started to process that as a mature adult and go, well, wait a minute, why am I honoring something that's not biblical if I claim a biblical faith? And this has now, of course, been the challenge for all of us here. So all Yeshua was doing 2,000 years ago, and the equivalence of this with the Pharisees and the Sadducees is going, why do you transgress the commandments for the sake of your tradition? So I find myself saying, I said it to myself at one point, and now we say to others, don't we? Why do you transgress what you say for the sake of your tradition? It's a fair question. So we're not going to steer away from this question. We're not going to be shy from it. Can we desire to celebrate these and still be in repentance? Yes. The desire to celebrate something means that it's telling you you still have leaven in the house. But that doesn't mean you're not turned to the father in his ways. Do you know that I can still to this day sometimes have moments when all the pretty lights are out and everything else and whatnot. And as I'm sitting there self-righteously judging the neighbor who's got Santa Claus and the reindeer in lights on this roof of his house, you know, or her house, you know, and you sit there and you can you can feel good about, see, I am not deceived like my neighbor is <laughs> as you walk by. But yet subtly you're still enjoying the flickering little lights <laughs> bouncing off the snow and whatnot. And you're like going, this is interesting. I still like the atmosphere of the pretty little lights. Now, I don't like particularly this Santa Claus character and the myth and the reindeer or the nativity scenes or whatnot. So what's going on? What's happening here? Is it possible that just because it can link back to a memory or an understanding or I happen to like pretty little lights, whatever else it is, is it possible, though, that just because that's the case, that doesn't mean I'm still not actually turned to the father in his ways. Am I celebrating Christmas? Am I engaged in Santa Claus and reindeer or nativity scenes or, you know, whatever else is going on? No. But that doesn't mean there's still not a work being done to me. Does everyone get that? Do you get that, that you can actually still be struggling or still be wanting to do something, but you no longer do it? And it could be more than just obviously, I mean, we're just using right now Christmas as the example for this discussion, but this can be in any matter of repentance. You can be making the conscious choice to go, no, I stay turned to the father in his ways. Even with that desire. I choose truth. I choose set apartness. Here's where the questions start to get a little bit more interesting. Would we justify celebrating these if we were truly in a place of repentance? Now, this begs a much different journey in question, which I think the Ruach is taking us all through. And every year you'll see people struggle with this to various degrees. Can we be in a place of celebrating and justifying engaging in these things still and actually being a place of repentance. I'm going to suggest to you that I do not believe that's possible. I'm going to say something here with, you know, when we talk about the fruit of tradition, it's actually acceptance and justification that brings judgment biblically always has. It's not the struggle for which he had us born into without, by the way, our permission You didn't decide that you'd be born. You didn't decide you'd be born fallen. And you certainly didn't decide you'd be born fallen into a world full of spiritual adultery. So he's taking accountability for this. We go through this so that we may understand our faith. But here's the thing. He is looking for whether I'm going to start to live a life of acceptance and justification of something. 
Because if I do, now judgment is assured. Because the reason for judgment is not because you have a God going, I need to whack some bad people so I can feel good about being a God. You actually have a creator in love where the only option in the end that we give him in order that we may hear, that we may see, is actually judgment coming down upon our heads for the purpose of repentance. Judgment is not there. While we live this world, when he's bringing judgment, it is not there. In fact, the warnings of judgments and the great prophets of old, including Yeshua and the disciples, and everything we read in scripture, is that we may turn to him in his ways, that we may enter into teshuva, or repentance. And I'd suggest to you that when we stay in a place of justifying and celebrating those which are not biblical, regardless of our reasoning, we are now risking judgment coming into our lives because we know better. It's not a joke because we're going to give him no other option but to open our ears and our eyes. And according to scripture, that generally takes fire if we're not in a place of repentance. So the word holidays comes from holy days. We're actually in the holy days season. So this is what we are. And now I'm going to ask you something. Does it feel like we're in the set apart season right now as you look around the world around you? Both in modern Judaism and Christianity with Christmas and Hanukkah? Are we really experiencing the set apart season? That's what holy means. Are we going to be honest about this? And really, what is the fruit of what we are seeing unfold in the world as a result of the holy days season? I can completely understand why people without a faith celebrate these. But what I am getting more and more irritated by, and if I am, I can <laughs> tell you that a set apart Elohim, God, is the thing people should worry about. So I'll give the warning now. The defense of ancient paganism and traditions that are occurring now by so-called believers is not good, healthy ground. In fact, it could be grounds for judgment. And in fact, I think we're actually seeing that. And he will allow the adversary to carry out, and those around us, this judgment upon a believing people that claim certain things. Why would we see the need to even defend ancient paganism and traditions? Even if we think, oh, well, it's not paganism that's made its way into this, and, you know, oh, wow, well, you know, this is maybe tradition, but it still has a significant historical context. Yeah. I don't care. Whatever your position is. Been a lot of fake news around all this stuff, too. A lot of the claims of paganism in Christmas often are very misrepresented and just quite frankly incorrect. However, that does not change some of the influences that have come from ancient pagan traditions that have made their way into something we call Christmas. And nothing you do pointing out all the fake news and incorrect attacks on Christmas changes that fact, believer. What you're doing is wrong. If you wish to defend paganism and traditions, you do so in front of your God. Not your fellow believer, because your fellow believer is not the one who will judge you. It doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the one who bought you with his blood thinks. Does everyone get that? Our opinion doesn't matter. So all we can do here as a journey is to figure out how he views things. As a God. Can we 
can we self-righteously attack these traditions and look bad in his eyes? Yes. Can we compromise ourselves to such a degree and justify that we would look bad in his eyes? Do we want a river of life perspective? Hands up in this community if we really want to be in that place where we're going to be pleasing to him despite all the silliness that we see on either side of the river. Awesome. Because that's the community that will continue to grow, that will continue to have its heart circumcised, which is done with the acceptance, the justifications, or the self-righteousness. There is no room for any of these things as we deal with these things every year. May we be different in this regard. So this defense of traditions and ancient paganism, in 2 Peter 22, 23, it says this, for it would have been better for them to never known the way of righteousness. Righteousness is established in something we call the Torah. This is the front of the book. This is the foundation of our faith. It tells us and lets us understand what is right and what is wrong and what constitutes sin or missing the mark. It's better for them to have not to have never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Whoa. It's better that you've never understood this than to get into justification, acceptance mode on something. It says here, it goes on to say, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow or the swine, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Of course, that has the overtones of the prodigal son there, splashing around in the pig pens and the mud and whatnot. But the dog returning to its own vomit, both of these are creatures in a state of unclean now. And they're returning to something. And if you don't get into discipleship, if you don't deal with something inside you, called leaven, spiritual adultery, that wants to justify celebrating things which are not biblical. It wants to go there. We're going to talk about why. If we get into that mode, well, just a little bit, just a little bit of Santa, just a little bit of lighting these candles, just a little bit of these gifts, just a little bit of whatever it is, and just a little bit starts to then leaven the whole lump. Oh, and don't think that intellectually you're above this. If you think intelligence is greater than the spiritual battle, you are in folly. Your intelligence has no chance against spiritual darkness, none. You are done. If you think that you can do it on your so-called intelligence or knowledge, you're finished. We wouldn't even be having this conversation thousands of years later if that had been the case. Unless, of course, you're personally the smartest person who's ever lived, and you're the smartest person who's ever lived and isn't affected by the adversary of this world and spiritual darkness. In fact, you're so great intellectually and spiritually that we should just be listening to you in all your social media and your emails and your ranting and ravings, justifying and accepting all of these things which are not biblical. Right? Because you're the smartest person and the strongest spiritual person who's ever lived. So therefore, we should listen to you and not the word. Does anybody think I'm being a little facetious here? <laughs> is, anybody, is anybody here offended yet? <laughs> I'm seeing this all over the place on social media and teaching. Every year I see this garbage whether it's self-righteously attacking people or whether it's intellectually trying to justify and accept it. And I'm here to tell you that I do not believe that anywhere in scripture endorses or blesses or is acceptable to Elohim on either side. Our job is to be in a place of repentance, not to be in the unclean state. If you don't get into discipleship, if you don't get that vomit that is coming out of you that falls onto the ground tilled up, if you don't get that ground tilled up, guess what a dog does? It returns to its vomit because the vomit's still there. 
You didn't till the ground. You didn't walk it out. And even though you might have vomited up and said, oh, okay, this Christmas thing, I don't want to do this anymore. And that vomit sat there on the ground, but you didn't have any discipleship. And it sat there and it sat there and it sat there. And then eventually, ooh, the vomit started to look good because you got a bit hungry. And then the dog looks at the vomit and goes, hmm, there's still some chunky leaven in that vomit there. I could go and lap some of that up, nourish myself. Well, you want to nourish yourself on vomit long enough, you'll die. That's it. None of us can survive on vomit. This is why it says it would be better for them to never have known the way of righteousness because they would never have vomited it in the first place if they'd never known it. But because they did and they vomited this out, now they're trying to have sustenance off the vomit. Do you see the point? And if you do, you will die. And if that's spiritual, you will die spiritually. Matthew uh, 18, 4 to 6. It's like this. Whoever humbles himself like uh, this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The child is wanting to know. Tell me, dad. Tell me, father. What is it I need to know? They come running. Riddle me this, riddle me that. And the child absorbs. This is why the instructions of the Shema and Torah and Deuteronomy. Teach your child in my ways. In these early formative years. All you parents know this, how important it actually is. Whoever receives one child in my name, think of this spiritually now, receives one child spiritually in my name, receives me. But whoever causes one of these spiritual little ones who believe in me to sin, miss the mark. You don't get to make it up. This ain't a Catholic session. Sin is defined by the front of the book. It's called the Torah. Whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to miss the mark of his righteousness, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. The metaphor there being the people of the world be better off being in the muck, in the mud, than facing the judgment of this. You want to teach little ones that this stuff that is not of him is okay spiritually? Thinking you know where it will lead them? Thinking you know better because you're all so intelligent? The father knows my heart. Yes, he does. Your heart's desperately wicked. Okay, don't have that one as an argument. Aren't they just good fun, good times and harmless fun? Yeah, could be for a while. Doesn't mean they're not going to cause them to lose their faith or stumble in it. That's not what it means to me, Curtis. I don't care what it means to you. It's what it means to him. The abuses and fake news by well-intended believers or not concerning pagan holidays and rituals and traditions does not, uh, I got chance there, change the ancient origins or schemes of the adversary. In other words, you don't get to use somebody else misappropriately attacking Christmas or putting something on it or whatever it might be and go, see, that's not what it is. They got that wrong to somehow now that makes Christmas suddenly right. You don't get to do that. And just because there has been false allegations made against some of these traditions and the origins of them does not change the actual origins of them, nor the adversary, nor what they are doing working with the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and pride of life. And what we are warned about in scripture, not to take up the way of the heathen. It doesn't change that. So somebody misappropriately attacking Christmas does not put it suddenly in the good books. Does everybody understand that? And I'm seeing this happen in the defense of things by, from believers. It is one thing going, well, I want to celebrate Christmas. I can handle that. It's quite another going, I want to defend it. There's a big difference. What about what it means to him? Do we actually care? I'm going to suggest to you that those in repentance will care. 
The whole warning is based around lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. We have a disease called iniquity. Three darts, fiery darts of the enemy in our diseased fallen state that he uses. Now, would you say that Christmas has lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life attached to it? <laughs> I'd also suggest to you a tradition called Hanukkah now has lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life attached to it as well. Oh, but wait a minute. Aren't we just attacking Christmas? By the way, just because something's a tradition doesn't make it bad or evil. Now, I'm not even suggesting that anybody trying to celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah, for that matter, is being bad or evil. What I am saying is there are elements that the fact that these are traditions, whether you understand their origins or not, play on something called lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. It doesn't change. They're not biblical, as in appointed times. First John 2, 15, 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the traditions of man are the world. It's that simple. So it says not to love it. It doesn't mean that you can't have a tradition. I personally don't mind the tradition of Hanukkah celebrated the way it is by many of my Jewish family and friends. It's a tradition, just like Thanksgiving for the Christians. I don't attack them for it. But don't be in love with this and raise it to the level of an appointed time, to the level of scripture. Because once you're in that space, then it is love. And I've got scripture that says, whoa, 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 you're taking this too far now. Okay, do you see the point? I don't need to get self-righteous now on all this stuff in either direction, on anyone. I don't attack Christians for celebrating Thanksgiving any more than I attack my Jewish friends or Messianic friends for doing Hanukkah. But if it is elevated to the level of his word, we have warnings in scripture now. Does everybody understand that? It's important now that we get this. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, or think lust, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. So what future does Hanukkah and Christmas have in the age to come? Does anybody know? <laughs> Zero. Okay. All right. So just so you know, if we elevate this into some spiritual significance, what scripture is telling you is please don't do that. That's folly. Okay. That's all. It's giving the warnings now of this. And the world is passing away long as this does. But whoever does the will of Elohim abides forever. Beautiful. So we want to get to the front of the book so that we know what this is. Sunday gatherings, weekly gatherings, Thanksgiving, the annual harvest, Easter, the death and resurrection of Messiah, according to the Christians, Halloween, all saints. Uh, you know, they try and wrap that up now with, uh, with sanguine, which is the uh, origins of Halloween. Truly paganism. Christmas, then now the birth of the Messiah. Not that we acknowledge any of its modern uh, relationship to the Roman practices of Saturnalia. And by the way, they are true. They really were practices in Saturnalia, even though contrary to the pagan defenders. Um, Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication. What is this Feast of Dedication? Here's my point. Everything you're seeing on this screen right now is not an appointed time. It's not biblical. Does everybody get that? Whether you're doing this or not, I am not attacking you self-righteously and going, I am better than you. I know more than you or this or you're evil because you do these things and all that kind of stuff. And we're not going there. But what I am going to tell you is this. If you engaged with any of these things in your walk and you're a person of faith, you are not in a biblical practice. And nothing we do intellectually or spiritually changes that. Does everybody get that? You can't suddenly make these biblical. Whether you do them or not. Am I going to attack you for doing any? No. But am I going to accept and justify that you should do them so that we can feel good? No. I'm not going to do that either.
Scripture is very clear in Leviticus, in the Torah. This is what it says. So both Jew and Christian and everyone alike and in between, listen up. And Yah spoke to Moshe saying, speak unto the children of Israel. Not the land of Israel, not the political parties of Israel, the children of Israel, the people of Israel. And say unto them, the appointed times of Yah. Okay, these are the appointed times of our creator. Not mine, not yours. Not anyone's. Not Walmart's. Not the Jewish synagogue, not the Christian church, not the 30,000 plus denominations, not the Hebrew roots, Messianic movements, nothing. These are the appointed times of the creator, of the father, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. Wait a minute. I want you to take my appointed times and you shall proclaim them. Well, if we're proclaiming all these other things which aren't in the Bible, well, what about proclaiming the ones that are? All these other ones that aren't mentioned in our faith, and in fact, arguably warned against not getting caught up with these things in our faith, the ones we are to proclaim are the ones given to us in the Torah. Well, you listen to the appointed times. These are my appointed times. So I often say to somebody, why is it that you're doing everything I can't find in Scripture, but the ones I can find in Scripture, you don't do, and you justify not doing, but the ones I can't find in Scripture, you do do and justify doing? Hmm. And you're telling me you're a person, a man or a woman of faith. Really? What faith? The appointed times of our creator are not modern Jewish feasts and holidays. Modern Judaism has done a form of retaining the celebration of these things. And to many degrees, I say this as well, I'm often indebted to because at least they kept something going that had a biblical truth, <laughs> given what I was brought up in, which had nothing to do with biblical appointed times. So am I thankful for that? Yes. Regardless of how bastardized a lot of that shadow pictures become in modern Judaism. What if they were ultimately about a Messiah, a king, and a groom? These appointed times of our creator. What if that's what they were about and you don't want to know? What if they're teaching us the great plan of redemption and restoration of his people? So all of this is pointing to the one we claim to love and telling us all about his great plan of redemption. These biblical feasts. Again, if you haven't and you're seeing this for the first time, I urge you go back to some of the appointed times teachings. We address these appointed times every year in teachings. Go into um, uh, the Donkey Speaks YouTube channel, um, the Olive Branch channel. Go and look at the teachings around these. The spring appointed times all pointed to our Messiah, all pointed to the great plan of redemption and restoration. They were fulfilled exactly to the day in sequence in the same year. They all speak of what we should have been honoring and celebrating the whole time. And the fall, yet to be fulfilled. And they will yet literally be fulfilled to the day in sequence in the same year. And they refer to the arrival of him now as king. And guess what? We're getting closer to this one. Our Messiah is getting close. And you're about to see many of us may actually experience this. The actual living of the fall appointed times in their fulfillment. Stunning. Anybody excited at what stage we are in the whole plan as we come to the end of the second day or 2,000 years? This isn't stunning. It's incredible. We're in an incredible time, but we must be in this place of repentance. So go and look at some of these and learn more about them and why I'm even mentioning them here. But I have to do that for the sake of this teaching because we're not just going to criticize something without actually giving the truth of where we should go to because this all revolves around what is the fruit of tradition. In Isaiah 1, 14, 15 here, it says this, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me, new moon, Sabbaths, and the calling of convocations. I can't endure iniquity in solemn assembly. In other words, even my biblical feast, you're bastardizing. Yes, we're seeing this. Your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hates. Oh, that's not just 
Christmas and Hanukkah and all the secular ones. By the way, this is actually the way we choose to even honor his appointed times. They become a burden to me. I'm wary of burying them. We brought all sorts of things into the house. We don't get to just use secular traditions as the thing that we attack on this. It is also about how we ourselves seek to honor the biblical feasts. We're not off the hook. So this is important that we get together in a place of repentance and want to learn the why of it all. Why are we celebrating any of these traditions and these sorts of things? And I say for people that are new to this, a lot of them is based around the winter solstice. This gets back to a whole journey of something that gets back to ancient Babylon, which progressed its way. You went so from Egypt to ancient Babylon to Rome and now into modern society. Has there been a thread of the adversary that has come through all these ancient cultures starting in the warning of scripture of the captivity of the Babylonian influences that were on the house of Israel would continue right till the coming or the second coming or the king, Messiah? And there is all throughout scripture. It links it back to this mystery Babylon, this spiritual adultery that would find its way through. So if you want to defend Christmas to your folly, oh, you better believe what we're dealing with now. We'll find its ancient spiritual roots in something warned about thousands and thousands of years ago, going right back to ancient Babylon. And indeed was carried on with Rome called the Feast of Saturnalia. This is real. This is what they did. And Constantine literally was involved an influence. He celebrated Saturnalia himself. This is this had come, the practice of Saturnalia had come in its ancient origins, if you link it right back from Babylon. Elements of it. Of course, these things evolve and they don't all look exactly the same or whatnot, but these practices, ancient practices get carried on. It's why we do what we do now. With things that we do when we celebrate Christmas. We're dealing with some things that had entered into the celebration of Christmas over a thousand years ago from different cultures and whatnot, yet we're doing it to, oh, of course, it's repackaged. It looks a little different, everything else, but it doesn't change that there's been this thread that has come through, a spiritual thread that warned about in Scripture. And just because I can take modern-day Christmas and talk about Saturnalia 2,000 years ago and talk about the ancient pagan rituals that related to, to, to Babylon – and go, see, that doesn't look like Christmas, doesn't mean that there is not a thread and the same spiritual darkness that led me to something to put above the biblical times. Scripture's warning is do not learn the way of the heathen. Not if you're not practicing exactly like they did in ancient Babylon, you know, 3,000 years ago, therefore Christmas is okay. What kind of stupid thinking is that? You either really understand that where there's smoke, there is fire. And that is exactly what the scripture is warning about. What made its way through, if not only the heart position of going, I'd rather do this than do what I'm supposed to. Because job's done. Even if there was only one thing that was similar to 2,000 years ago in the ancient practice of Saturnalia, which is not the case. There's a lot of things similar to Saturnalia that we see in modern day Christmas. But even if there was only one little tiny, tiny element, but that tiny, tiny little bit of leaven that made its way through this tradition, if that had prevented you from doing the appointed times biblically and you chose to engage in a love for the world and its tradition, if that little bit of leaven leavened the whole lump, job done. So I don't have to make an argument that Christmas, modern day Christmas looks exactly like Saturnalia. You just need to believe what scripture is warning about and understand the thread of spiritual adultery that has made its way through and darkness and wickedness. And its job is to take you away from looking at and honoring your creator. Does everyone understand that? The job is not to make an argument that modern day Christmas exactly marries or matches ancient Saturnalia practiced by Rome. And I'm seeing believers try and make these arguments to go, see, it's not like Christmas. It's not like Christmas. It's not like Christmas. Ignore a bunch of things that have made its way through. But just paint this picture. You know why? Because it's in their heart. I want you to celebrate Christmas because I want to. And I don't really love the father in his ways. I love this. And they won't admit it, so now you get into acceptance and justifying. 
and eventually will end up in judgment as a result. Nothing changes the fact that Elohim does not instruct us to celebrate any of these. In Daniel 7.25, it says this, and he shall speak words against the Most High. These are the great prophecies in Daniel warning about what the adversary was going to do and what he would go after. This is thousands of years ago being written by Daniel of where the focus of the attack of the adversary or spiritual darkness was going to be. He shall think to change the appointed times. Whose appointed times? His appointed times. And the law or the covenant or the definition of righteousness. Wow. The very de definition of sin. And they shall be given to him his times, times and half of times. Now referring right to the end. When, when we're dealing with this period called the Great Tribulation or 1,260 calendar Hebrew days. Or three and a half Hebrew years. Do you know? If Daniel's warning about this thousands of years ago, what the enemy was going to go after, he was going to go after the appointed times and the father's Torah and covenant. Does anybody here want to take seriously what Daniel warned? You can ignore that. Or you can look now and we can look in the rearview mirror thousands of years later and know exactly that Daniel was telling the truth. Spiritually. That's exactly what we see in human history right up to now. We saw the father's appointed times attacked and we have seen his Torah being attacked and, the, and, and uh, from, the, from the Sabbath day itself being changed to honoring the appointed times, to celebrating things we ought not. It's all happened. And the warning out of these ancient prophets and something we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh was that the origin of this would be found in the ancient mystery Babylonian religions. And it's exactly what we can still see, albeit a scarlet thread to this day. How is it going to be done? Second Corinthians 11, 12, 14, it says this, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Messiah. What is warned about here in scripture is these false teachers and workers are going to tell you it's okay. Do anything but what the father's instructed you to do. It's okay. Oh, it feels good. It's nice. Heck, that's not what it means to me. This is good. Do you know with a lot of my Jewish friends now, do you know that Hanukkah is their biggest appointed time of the year? And it's not even appointed time. Unbelievable. Hanukkah means more to them now than any of the other so-called Jewish feast. How'd that happen? No wonder. For even Hasatan disguises himself as an angel of light. So the adversary is going to dress this up as an angel of light. Well, both of these feasts, both Christmas and Hanukkah, light is at the center of the lust of the eyes on both of them. So it's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Remember the little ones returning to our vomit, causing the little ones to stumble? Wait a minute. You're going to take people away from what they should be focused on? You're going to justify and accept this? Oh, but it's just harmless. The ancient practices of Babylon. We won't get into this too much, but I do want to make this point. In the early Babylon, custom was to go out and place a gift under trees in the winter solstice. We're going back thousands of years. This is an offering to Tumaz and Nimrod. Eventually, they bought the trees inside. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder if we still have a vestige of this type of behavior. And it was around the winter solstice, which we would think of as December 25th. The days are now going to start to get longer again. By the way, they exchanged gifts and they had drunken parties. Now, would I say that Christmas was the ancient practices, Babylonian practices of the celebration of Tumas and Nimrod and whatnot, and I'd be able to go see? They like, No, I can't actually go, okay, there you go. Christmas is exactly that. But what I can tell you is if you take the extraction of certain things out of this and see what made its way through. Oh, there's been some things that have survived, and I don't care what your justification or arguments are. These people are lying to you, whether they're doing it intentionally or not. 
They are teachers and false apostles deceiving and being deceived. They are not the father's appointed times. And there is vestiges back to spiritual darkness from ancient Babylon, just like it warned. From Babylon, Egypt to Rome. Look at this. By the way, under Daniel's statue, we're still in the time. The iron legs that goes into the 10 toes and the iron is mixed with clay. Nothing's changed. We're still under the Roman bondage. And it says the rock will come in his vision and it will smash the feet of the statue. These were all the kingdoms, the last one being Rome. And we've still got this mixed thing going on. This is why I often refer my euphemism of the secular world as Rome, because we're still in Roman bondage. It hasn't changed. The names have changed. The politics have changed. The modern flavors have changed. But make no mistake about it, where we're still at. Jeremiah 10, 2. Thus says Yah, learn not the way of the heathen. Not as something that he doesn't love or nothing like. He's saying heathen to do the opposite of what is right. Okay? It's not some term he's saying, I hate them. Learn not the way of these people and be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens. For the heathen are dismayed at them. And then it goes on to say, for the customs of the people are vain. They're vain. They cut the tree down and out of the forest. The work of their hands with the axe. And then they deck it with silver and gold. I'm sorry. You can, you can try and dress this up any way you want. But the reality of it is they brought the trees eventually into the house and decked them with silver and gold. <laughs> I'd say there's still some similarities that have made its way through thousands of years later. I'm sorry. You got no way around this. I don't care how achieved or what you want to dress it up as. Stop lying to the little ones. Stop deceiving people. Stop it. Your intellect is not greater than the spiritual darkness. You are in folly. And when you get this, when we all get this, something will happen in your heart and it will manifest in your actions. It's called repentance or teshuva. They fasten it with nails that it move not. Somebody says, oh, but that's not talking about Christmas. No, it's not. But is it possibly talking about something that has made a thread of its way into Christmas thousands of years later? You better believe it. And anything else is misleading you. The traditions of Mithra and all of this coming through Rome that eventually came, found its way out of ancient mystery Babylon right to Rome at the time of Yeshua and what was being practiced. And they were under this bondage. Judea was under the bondage of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a culture that celebrated things that had come from mystery Babylon. And then eventually what would take fold and come forth and eventually what would uh, happen with Constantine embracing the early church and its persecution almost three centuries after Messiah would eventually come into, because what had happened with the festival of Saturnalia, it was a week long celebration starting on the 17th to the 24th. And then eventually they established at the end of it or its crowning glory was Sol Invictus, the unconquering sun, because it would start, the days would start to become longer. Well, this was all a part of Roman practices at the time. And Constantine celebrated these things. And a lot of these things played an influence in what was called Saturnalia. Unfortunately, some of the behavior was really interesting. They did do things like feasting and drinking and going house to house in the streets. This is all recorded. You can go see it historically. Yes, you know, we've got very sanitized light versions of this and we do our Christmas carols and everything else. And somebody says, well, that doesn't mean that's where the Christmas carols came from. No, it doesn't. But those Christmas carols and the tradition of singing from house to house came from somewhere. And when I've done my homework, it starts to go back a long time. And then you get into an arguable gray area. Where did it ever come from at all? What I do know is what Saturnalia does happens to share a similarity with some things in Christmas, albeit sanitized. And I know the warnings of scripture. So gloss it up all you want or not. Do not cause the little ones to stumble. Do not be a dog returning to its own vomit. This was also a day where the masters would serve the slave in ancient Saturnalia and some of the activities would become openly sexualized and would actually involve children. This is how sick it got. Now, is that modern day Christmas? No, of course not. But there's some 
dark influences that have made its way through into something. And we do know that Christmas is not a biblical appointed time. So why am I defending something, even if I don't believe that Saturnalia had one iota of an influence on Christmas, why am I defending Christmas? It's still not scriptural. The fact that I can find a number of things, or a little bit 11, is stunning. The Emperor Constantine, who celebrated Saturnalia, ended up embracing Christianity as a form of state religion officially. Some of the old pagan festivities of Saturnalia eventually influenced and helped shape some of the modern Christmas celebrations. There is clear evidence of this, no matter what you want to say. Just in the fact that we know what Saturnalia is, we know how it was celebrated, and we know what is in Christmas. The fact that there are a lot of similarities should be of no surprise when you've got Constantine in the mix and politics. <laughs> if somebody wants to try and dance around that, well, then go right ahead. But they're lying to you. Why? I don't know. Then we got Hanukkah. Mythical cruise of oil. Where does this come from? I'm going to suggest to you that a lot of this became a replacement for Christmas when people woke up and realized what I just said about Saturnalia possibly being an influence for many of the Christian traditions. And they don't, people didn't want anything to do with that. So then they went across on the flying fox or the zip line and they landed on the other side of the bank and said, well, we'll do Hanukkah now. Again, not biblical. So what is Hanukkah? What is this happy Hanukkah? It's not an appointed time. It is a modern Jewish tradition, at least of the last 2000 years, the Feast of Dedication. There was a Maccabean revolt. You can go back and have a look at this, this taking back of the temple, incredible historical account of our Jewish brethren at the time. I don't want to demean this event, nor will I. I think it's an event worth talking about and remembering. In fact, this is why I say, I don't even think that it's such a bad tradition. <laughs> to remember such the events any more than remembering events that affect um you know other aspects of culture and life but again let's not make it biblical and if it's become a replacement for christmas in our hearts because there's lights and there's gifts and there's things then is that leaven truly out of our house and do we now give the opportunity because it's not to eventually return to our vomit. By the way, I will tell you, I have seen Christians wake up to the realization that Christmas was not biblical. They took the flying fox, went over and celebrated Hanukkah for many years, and then got burned by the Jewish and the Messianic Hebrew roots self-righteous garbage that was occurring over there. And guess what they ended up doing in the end? They went back and now they're celebrating Christmas again. You mean they returned to their vomit because they never got it out of the house in the first place. I'm not attacking Hanukkah here. What I'm saying is, has this become a replacement for Christmas? Because if it has, you still got something in the house. Get it out. It's not biblical. And if it's allowing you even the opportunity to retain leaven, you don't know where that possibly could end up going in your life. Do you see my point? It says come out of her. I'm not attacking the tradition of Hanukkah, but it is a tradition, a man-made one at that. It's not biblical. Albeit a tradition that if someone wishes to honor, fine. I don't see this as having some pagan origins attached to it other than, you know, man traditions. The mythical menorah, the cruise of oil, these are some of the fables attached around it, and it kept burning, and the oil wouldn't run out. Anyway, go and have a look at all of this. Um, it's really kind of interesting, this whole account of where we get Hanukkah from. But the Maccabees searched out for this pure oil of light under the myth, and so on and so on. So again, being turned to myths and fables. There's a lot of fables around this whole story of the Maccabean revolt and taking back the temple. So this, the uh, cruise of oil, the cruise contained just enough pure oil to keep the manure lit for one day in order to make for individuals making the oil to be in a state of spiritual purity. So then they started adding on some spiritual context to all this stuff out of fables. You know what? Now we're starting to get into what was warned about in scripture. Okay. And some of these stuff even exists in the traditions surrounding Hanukkah. Soldiers returning from the battlefield and back beings were deemed impure, could make the pure oil ritually for seven days. And this all a part of the story now. And this, the Maccabeans could only produce additional pure oil after eight days. You know, really? You know, I mean, you know, this is their version of the reindeers, you know, and now we're starting to get into this place. The Maccabeans uh, have been unable to light the menorah for seven days before the completion of the new pure oil. Miraculously, one cruise of the oil had lasted for eight days. And by that point, 
you know, so on and so on. So in other words, they've taken the tradition and they've added some spiritual significance and things to it and so on and so on. Does Yeshua honor Hanukkah? I get this as well every year. So we'll just address this before we look at what is this really about with the fruit of tradition? This is what's always used, John 10, 22 to 27. And at that time, the Feast of Dedication, or what we call uh, Hanukkah, took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking in the temple and in the colonnade of Solomon, or the porch of Solomon. This is where they would announce things to the people from the Sanhedrin system. So the truth would come forth from the, from the priests on Solomon's porch. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So they're going, they're doing this at Solomon's porch. They're holding him to account if you know what's going on here. We know truth comes from this porch. So you tell us plainly right now. There's no coincidence where they're challenging him on this, just so you know where this is occurring actually in the temple. It says, Yeshua answered them, and I told you, you do not believe me. The works I do in my father's name bear witness about me. The works he does. Not what they're doing, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Do you know that none of this tells you, none of it, that Yeshua honored the Feast of Dedication? It tells you that he was there and may have even been using that gathering as an opportunity to point to them the folly of it in comparison to doing the will of the father. I can take these same verses that I see people trying to use and I can actually make a bigger case using the original Greek that Yeshua was actually using the fact they were doing this as the example of what they should be doing, which is doing the will of the father and you're not doing that, my sheep are. That's why they're not here. Interesting whole different take on this now isn't it but i often see this one quoted and i go i'm sorry believer hebrew root or messianic christian whatever don't use this this isn't this isn't your scripture go to scripture <laughs> at least not around me <laughs> hopefully not you this is what is in Revelation 120. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on the right hand and the seven golden lamps and the seven stars and the messengers of the seven kahal and the seven candlestick lampstand and the seven kahal. In other words, this is where we get fashioned off an almond tree, the modern day menorah. What is interesting and what I do see happen in scripture um, is that very revelation where it is mentioned, the seven branch candlestick, that same scriptures do not add or take away from the revelation of Messiah. What I do find interesting is the Hanukkah is a nine branch candlestick, not biblical in any sense. And it appears they've added on some stuff because of these extra days. <laughs> Look, I don't want to make something too big out of this, but when I see a Hanukkah, I don't see anything that I can find in scripture. At least when I see a menorah, I can see at least something that's trying to reflect something I can see in scripture. <laughs> do you see my point? Don't add or take away. It just muddies the water. I'm not attacking somebody as a Hanukkah. I'm not even attacking somebody celebrating Hanukkah. Again, we're just saying, if you elevate these things above the Father, are we his sheep, according to Yeshua? If we do this, because I tell you, I truly have Jewish friends where Hanukkah is the most celebrated time of the year and not the biblical feast. Wow. So was Hanukkah this tradition used to help deceive some of my Jewish brethren. Yes. And do you think I'm happy about that? I don't care what you're using. Whether it's Hanukkah or a movie of Satan teaching you how to slay goats and drink their blood. The latter would be easy to detect, wouldn't it? But scripture warns us about angels of light. <laughs> Things that come in disguise. Look, without attacking those who are celebrating Christmas and those who are celebrating Hanukkah and doing this on either side, what is the long-term fruit? And this is the reason for the angle and the teaching today. Everything is becoming a big sewer out there. I'm going to show you something here. So whatever you're doing, there's not an attack on you for this. Again, we're just going to finish with this part of the teaching. 
Hanukkah and Christmas are not biblical. And they are not an appointed time which we are instructed to honor and to celebrate that we may be a light to the world. Neither one of these are mentioned as being a light to the world. They are a light to our flesh, to our eyes, and to our pride. So we're going to be honest with that because there is a sewer occurring. The fruit of these being elevated at equal or above the appointed times now by believers and unbelievers alike. The sewer of this is getting rotten and it's affecting the children. This is why you find in Revelation 13, 15, 17, I know your works. This is Laodicea, either cold or hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So he's actually wishing, I wish you were either, either or. In other words, you're not doing any of these. It's as secular as you come. You could care less or you're doing my, you know, you're doing it full on. But because you are sitting in this lukewarm place, no one can tell what is truth or untruth or whether it really matters. Oh, well, it's okay. It's all because there's nothing here going on. He's saying, I'd rather you be flying the flag of celebrate Hanukkah and do it as much as you can. And this is the greatest spiritual thing there is or Christmas. Do it. This is all about Jesus, whatever. But when we sit in this place, well, you know, it's okay. This is the one apparently that the creator has to spit out of his mouth because he can't do anything with it. And the ones doing this say, well, I am rich, I'm prospered, I need nothing, not realizing they are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, the ones claiming this are saying, I don't need anything. I'm okay. Matthew 5, 11 to 14. Blessed are you when others reveal or revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So you better be giving his truth in order to be having reviling and persecution going on because those who don't give his truth don't face that. For you to be reviled and persecuted means you're going to be speaking something that is offending others. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Look at this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lost its taste, how shall it, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown and trampled out under people's feet. This is going to be the reason for judgment. This is the reason for the fires, all these sorts of things. Because if we get to a point where we've lost our salt, where we're just justifying and accepting anything and everything, we're of no good and of no use to the Father. This is what it says. You are the light of the world. Not the Christmas tree lights, not the Hanukkah lights. We are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Revelation puts it the new Jerusalem. I seen coming down adorned like a bride. We are the light of the world. Or we are not. We were not called to be the light of Christmas or the light of Hanukkah. We were called to be the light of the world. Of the appointed times of Yah. Which tell us, teach us and point to the one who bought us with his blood. That is our faith, or it is not. Happy holy days, really? The greatest source of domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, suicide, depression, and marital stress occurs in the month of December. It's good fruit. These set-apart days, isn't it? We're entering the set-apart days where we can see the harvest of domestic violence, drug, alcohol, abuse, suicide, depression, and marital stress. Does that sound right to anyone? The main root causes, according to a number of secular studies, but it's interesting what, in the end, what drops out of all of it. Excessive commercialization, media hype, consumer society materialism. Gifts, rewards, decorations, disconnected from a faith or spiritual meaning. Even the secular studies get that. <laughs> the excessive commercialization has disconnected people away from a spiritual and faith perspective of the holy days or the holy days. Unreal ex realistic expectations, family gatherings. Look at this. Perfect celebrations, the movies, the magazines, the social media. Wow. 
time constraints, being overcommitted, even missing out. In other words, all these expectations that now come away with trying to get these things into play start to bear this fruit that starts to create anxiety, which is feeding into the depression. Financial pressures, the right or good enough type of gifts, too many gifts. What if you've suffered a job loss, especially like many are right now, not able to afford gifts, food even, decorations, ending up with feelings of shame and guilt at this time of the year. These are all things that they're starting to see that is creating all of these stats. And then, of course, there's the painful memories, painful memories, loss of loved ones, loneliness, guilt, feelings of shame, unsaid, unspoken words, things that were never dealt with, with those lost ones, a sense of unworthiness. Do you really, do we really want to be bringing in the hand of judgment, self-righteousness here or acceptance to somebody who is literally living all of these things? Or do they need to see the light of the world? All of these things are in direct relationship to lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and pride of life and the fruit that it's breeding. And even the secular world is figuring this out, at least in their terms. Why the sexualized agenda that we're now seeing with this? Because by the way, now we're going to start to see ancient mystery Babylon's going to start making her way back in. Oh yeah, we're connected into Saturnalia, all right. It's just got a whole new face. It's the same spiritual darkness and wickedness because it's not of Elohim. Our kids are now being subjected to all sorts of things here. I got to get into this because some of the pictures just get so disgusting that I just can't do it. Oh, you better believe Christmas is being sexualized and its agenda. Huh? So is Hanukkah. It's being sexualized as well. It's all happening over there too. It's all becoming about something that is very familiar in Saturnalia. Now getting really interesting. Now we're heading into some new territory. Do you know the push on now around the gay agenda, sexualized agenda coming into these holidays? By the way, what you're seeing there is an image of a recent commercial. If you haven't seen it, you try and stomach your way through it. This is a new commercial that's come out this year in Norway. came out a couple of weeks ago. And Santa basically has been grooming the little boy all his life. And now they're men. And he's come back and he's missed Santa all these years. And Santa comes and appears at the end of the commercial that he's the little boy asked for him for Christmas. And it finishes with them kissing and everything. I mean, it's wonderful, isn't it? Oh, don't worry. Hanukkah's getting in on the act as well. What's going on here? Why do we need to sexualize this? Why do we need to bring in same-sex things? Why do we need to do this? What is going on? What sits and underlies these things? What is this thing that is not of the Father? These traditions, these spiritual journeys that are now being able to influence these celebrations that apparently are all about the creator. I can tell you that there is a whole darkness and a whole side that is coming in. And if you think your creator is into this, be it the Hanukkah or the Christmas side, I'm sorry, you don't know him. Anybody offended yet? <laughs> you want your ears itched? Turn it off. Turn this off right now. going to get more. In Hosea 2, 10, 11. It's always been this way. Am I surprised the sexualization and the agenda that's coming through things which are not his appointed times? No. We were warned about it. And of course, that spiritual darkness was going to find its way through regardless of our intentions. Good intentions, mostly. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. Do you know we're getting to a time of the judgment, the Bema seat of Messiah. This promises the restoration of the house that would happen with a groom, a king, a Messiah. Now this is very interesting what we see here in Hosea because the whole story of Hosea is about him, you know, the taking on 
of a spiritually adulterous wife, which of course was the shadow picture of what our God did with us. We are the spiritual adulterer. We're the ones. We're her. And if you understand what the book of Hosea is doing, if you don't, I go back and go, go through. Um, I do a, a whole series on the book of Hosea. Now I uncover lewdness, lewdness, the nabluth there in the Hebrew, immodesty, shamefulness. This has a female connotation. In the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. This whole thing he plans to uncover. Basically, she's naked beneath the covers, sleeping with another woman. And I will put an end to her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbath, and her appointed feasts. Wow. He's going to put an end to the spiritual adultery that she is engaged in. And the whole picture is her in bed with another woman. Why is it a sexual agenda coming out with Christmas and now Hanukkah? Because they're not of him. They're of man. They're of the world. And if the world's affected by lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, if it is in spiritual darkness and does not have the light of Elohim's truth and his spirit, where else is it going to end? Of course it's going to end in a sexualized, debaucherous manner. It was the promise of scripture in romans 1 24 26 says this therefore elohim gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to impurity to dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves because they exchanged the truth about elohim for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator this is the price of creation worship or gaiism as our world has put environmentalism and everything ahead of the creator the price of this is going to be that we are going to end up dishonoring ourselves with each other. You mean the price of worshiping the creation is going to be sexual immorality? Yes, because it will be what replaces our spirituality. And now we're 100% fully exposed or our lewdness is being exposed and uncovered now to the spiritual darkness. For this reason, Elohim gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the woman exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. You mean the very result of us walking away from his ways? For worshiping the creation is going to be all manner of sexual immorality impurity and it's exactly what we're seeing and is exactly what we're now seeing come out in what is paganism at its roots and something called christmas it is disturbing watching that but i'm also seeing some disturbing things now come through obviously celebrations to do with hanukkah and even though its origins are not pagan um in that sense um we're still seeing that it is of man and so we're seeing the fruit of it come through. And what's that fruit? What is the long-term fruit of our traditions? What really is this fruit? No repentance. This is the goal of the adversary and the spiritual darkness. It always has been, always will be. And don't think he won't use Christmas and Hanukkah to achieve that. He will. I want to take you to something. We're going to go back to Joshua 4, 8 to 9. I'm going to show you something very interesting. I was putting together this teaching and something that the Father revealed that was astounding to me as to what was actually going on when we look at or understand repentance. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. Just as Yah told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to the place where they had lodged and laid them down. And Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. 
and in the place where their feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. What is going on here? Because we know the 12 tribes from the sons of Jacob are now going into the promised land. And we see the great miracle of the Jordan parting and this instruction of these 12 stones. And Joshua himself is putting them in the midst of the Jordan and the priest standing there with the covenant of Elohim stood in that place until Joshua places the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel as they go into the promised land. What is going on? It goes on to say, for the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst until everything was finished that Yah commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moshe had commanded Joshua. The people then passed over in haste. Now let's go forward a little bit. There's a great mikvah shadow picture occurring for the house of Israel as they cross through the Jordan into the promised land. What was this shadow picture pointing to? In Matthew 3, 5, 7, we see something very interesting here. John the Immerser, Yochanan the Immerser is doing something. He's baptizing the mikvah of the people for the one who would come. Look at this. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. This is Yochanan the Immerser. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, look at what Yeshua says here. And he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, the wrath is one of the times of his appointed times. We know this. This is interesting. This is the statement during the mikvah or Yochanan the Immerser, who did not consider himself worthy to be a part of this event with Yeshua. Look at this. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Okay, here's our king. And he's picking this moment to make this statement. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. We have our father, Abraham. Think about what even modern day Judaism is doing. Never mind the Sanhedrin at this time. I don't need Messiah. But look at this. For I tell you, Elohim is able from these stones to raise up the children for Abraham. Oh, my goodness. Was he standing on them? The very stones that were laid by the priests that were standing there with the ark. The ark of the covenant that were instructed to be put there by God to remain there to this day in the Jordan. And now we have Messiah saying this. Elohim is able from these stones to raise up the children for Abraham. Do you believe this to be a coincidence? And it's all about keeping with repentance. Is this just a word we use? Or does it refer to the restored house of Israel? How important really is this? We better know what repentance is. It's not saying sorry for your bad behavior. It is not a Christian Catholic model or even a modern Judeo model. Repentance is turning to him and his ways. Metanoia in the Greek, Teshuvah in the Hebrew, to turn back to Yah and his ways. Fruit met for repentance. There was no New Testament Christian. He's making the statement, bring fruit met for repentance. The only place you could go to to understand repentance was to be honoring what was recorded in something we call the Torah, which is at the front of the book. Matthew 3, 1, 3, we now see this. In those days, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what he was doing before this great event. This incredible fulfillment of scripture. For it is this who is spoken by the prophet Isaiah, who he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yah, make his path 
straight. Repentance. This is the often what is referred to by the believers that were the reference was to Isaiah 43. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of Yah, make straight in the desert of the highway for Elohim. I also believe that we're seeing in Isaiah here, not often quoted, relates to Isaiah 57, 14, 15. And then it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. In other words, the stumbling blocks that we spoke about earlier. Remove them. Remove Christmas. Out. Go. Yes, Hanukkah is a nice tradition. No, it's, it's, I, I don't believe there it has pagan origins. But if this is causing my Jewish brethren to have a stumbling block from Messiah, remove it. Just because I can celebrate Hanukkah and enjoy the tradition of the Maccabean revolt and not have the myths and the fables and everything else, but that could cause one of my Jewish brethren to stumble and not know Messiah, do you think I want to celebrate Hanukkah with them? any more than celebrating Christmas with my unbelieving family that he's yet to accept and understand Messiah. What are we doing? Prepare the way. Fruit met for repentance. This is not about arguing even pagan origins or rituals or traditions and whether they're right or wrong or we can do them and not do them, everything else. This has everything to do with, are we a light of the world? And if we are, what will our life look like? What will it look like to others? So that we are preparing a way. Fruit met for repentance. That involves the whole house, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the very feet that stood upon those stones when they came over into the promised land. In the great mikvah of the house of Israel. And what did it represent? The one standing on it was the one who would pay the price for this whole thing. Staggering. And for those, the one is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell on the, whole, the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. This is what even the secular studies found with people at this time of the year, believer and unbeliever alike, contrite, lowly spirit, people hurting right now. Go to them, remove the stumbling blocks, and give them the hope of the way, not the excuses to keep doing things because we like it. This is a matter of heart. They don't need the Torah Nazis. We don't need the excuses to not celebrate or honor his time on the Christian side. They don't need our self-righteousness. How about we witness in spirit and truth and love and we go to a people that are hurting at this time, our friends, our family. Are we really arguing about whether we should be doing Christmas or whether it's pagan or not? Are we really arguing whether we should be doing Hanukkah or whether it's a good tradition or not? Is that really what this is about? Or is it about us being a light at this time and going to the contrite and those that are hurting at this time? Because this is the fruit that is occurring right now during the holy days. Are we going to be those people or are we going to engage in the arguments of how bad Christmas is or Hanukkah or how good they are? John 4, 23, 24. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Yah, spirit that they worship him, must worship him in spirit and truth. John 8, 31, 32. Then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, this is the fun of the book. So this is our king speaking to those who are claiming to honor the faith. There is no New Testament. This is what he says. If you continue in my word, if you continue in my Torah, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Amen. Let's finish there.
Who was offended? <laughs> I asked for forgiveness at the very beginning. So he now got to give it to me at the very end, right? <laughs> okay, let's have a quick break. We'll come back for Q&A. We'll bring Mike along for the Q&A and, uh, and uh, go grab yourself a coffee uh, or go to the restroom, whatever you need to do. And we'll be back here in a few minutes. Bless you.